Hi, welcome to this session on point of cut ultrasound and shock. My name is Michael, an emergency physician from London with a postgrad diploma in medical ultrasound. This session will be in two parts. Firstly, how to use ultrasound to diagnose the underlying cause of your patient's shock. And secondly, how to use ultrasound to guide whether to give your patient IV fluids. But let's start with a case. So a 15 year old male presents to ED with two weeks of lethargy. He's hypotensive with a systolic of 75, a bit tachypneic and hypoxic, a little bit drowsy and a slightly raised temperature. So I was just walking past the Peds resus bay. Uh, one of the pediatricians was in with this young man trying to determine the cause of the shock and really struggling. Uh, and he saw me walk past with the ultrasound machine and beckoned me to come in and give him a hand. So I used a structured protocol for patients with undifferentiated shock called the RUSH exam, also known as high MAP. So the idea is your patient has a low MAP or mean arterial pressure and you want them to have a high MAP. A high MAP is also a mnemonic, so it stands for H for heart. And there are three things we look for in the heart, tamponade, RV dilation and LV impairment. Then I is for IVC. M is for Morrison's pouch, but this is really just free fluid in the abdomen. A is for aorta. And finally, P is for pneumothorax. So we start the high map exam with the heart. And the first view that I went for was the parasternal long axis view. So we have the marker to the patient's right shoulder and we have the probe across the heart in long axis. And this is what I saw. So this is the parasternal long axis at the top of the screen Closest to the probe, we have the right ventricle. Blood goes from there to the lungs and then back to the left atrium, through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then out the aortic valve into the ascending aorta, around the arch, and finally down through the descending aorta. So as I said, there's three things that we look for. First, pericardial fluid around the heart. Can't see any of that. Then, RV dilation. Can't see any of that. And finally, LV function. Now to assess LV function, just imagine a point in the middle of the chamber where the laser pointer is hovered and just look to see how well are the walls coming in towards that point. They should come in by about a third and also the walls should thicken by a third during systole. So what do you think? Is that normal or abnormal? It's abnormal. The walls are not coming in normally and they're not thickening normally. Now let me show you an example of a normal heart for comparison. So this is a normal parasternal long axis and now if we pop the laser pointer in the middle of the chamber we can see the walls are coming in by a third and they are thickening during systole. One other thing I'd like to bring your attention to is the mitral valve which is highlighted here in mustard. So here's the anterior leaflet at the top and the posterior leaflet deeper. This anterior leaflet should slap up into the septum. If it leaves a big gap that can be a sign of impaired LV function. So now if we go back to our case, here's the anterior leaflet Here's the septum, and there is a big gap here. That anterior leaflet is not slapping up into the septum. It's not getting anywhere close to the septum. So this can be a useful marker of impaired LV function. There are various ways to assess LV function, which range from relatively simple to more complex. We've talked about the eyeballing method, so just looking to see how much the walls move in towards the middle of the chamber and how much they thicken during systole. With experience, this can be quite a useful technique. EPSS stands for E-point septal separation, and it refers to the gap between that anterior mitral valve leaflet and the septum that we just mentioned. More on this in a second. MAPC is mitral annular plane systolic excursion. This also uses M mode and measures longitudinal function of the LV. LV VTI, velocity time integral. We'll talk more about this later in the talk. Ejection fraction, tissue Doppler, speckle tracking, there are lots of measures. But for now, we're just going to focus on the eyeball method, which we've discussed. And next, I'll say a few more words about EPSS. So as I mentioned, EPSS stands for E-point septal separation. So to measure EPSS, get a parasternal long axis, as shown here, and drop your M-mode line through the tips of the mitral valve. Then when you activate M-mode, you'll get a trace like this. So all the structures along the M-mode line are plotted along the Y-axis, and then along the X-axis you have time. So we're just isolating the structures that are along this very narrow line 
and we're just looking at what they do over time. So here's the mitral valve, there's the septum, there's the E point, the closest point that the mitral valve gets to the septum. And if we measure the point between the E point and the septum, that's the E point septal separation or EPSS. So in this example, it's prolonged, it's increased 29 millimeters. Here's an example of a normal EPSS. So here the mitral valve flicks up and slaps into the septum there. There's no gap there at all. So that's an EPSS of zero, but normal is anything less than seven millimeters. So to conceptualize a bit more why EPSS is a good marker of LV function, first let's imagine what happens uh, with normal LV function in a normal heart. So in a normal heart, you have a good, healthy, large volume of blood flowing through from the left atrium to the left ventricle. And so as this large volume of blood flows through, the mitral valve leaflets burst open. And that anterior leaflet is flung up and slaps up into the septum. So think of this as these three burly cowboys that are bursting through the saloon doors into the saloon to confront Clint Eastwood. So because it's a large volume of blood, they slap those doors open and the saloon door slaps into the wall of the saloon. However, if you have impaired LV function, then there will be a large gap between the E point and the septum. So here, just one thin cowboy is just creeping through the saloon doors and just pushing them open just enough just to get through. So this is because there's only a small volume of blood trickling from the left atrium to the left ventricle. So there's a reduced stroke volume. And so the mitral valve leaflet leaves a gap between it and the septum. So between the saloon door and the wall. There are a couple of caveats to EPSS. Uh, if there's a regional wall motion abnormality, or if there's mitral stenosis, then it may not be reliable. But in the vast majority of patients, I find this a very useful measure and it augments your eyeball method very nicely. And in fact, with experience, you can also just eyeball EPSS. If you can see that the anterior leaflet is slapping into the septum, you don't need to use MMO to measure it. You can just say it's normal. And if there's a massive gap, you can also say that's definitely abnormal. If it's borderline, then it's useful to use M mode to actually take a measurement and the cutoff is seven millimeters. But actually, most of the time now, I just eyeball EPSS along with eyeballing LV excursion and thickening. We should always look at at least two views of the heart. So this is the parasternal short axis. So I've now rotated the marker to the patient's left shoulder. So here we can see the left ventricle in short axis or cross section. So it looks like a donut if we imagine a point in the middle of the chamber, again, we see the walls are not coming in normally. They're not thickening normally. Here's the RV wrapped around the LV like a croissant around a donut. And another thing we can notice here is that the LV impairment is global rather than regional. So here's the LAD territory, here's the circumflex territory, and here's the right coronary territory, and they're all equally affected. So this is global severe LV systolic impairment. Next, I'll just show you a couple of the other examples of the pathology that we look for when we do a high map exam. So here is cardiac tamponade, this black or anechoic fluid around the heart is pericardial fluid. And here the RV is collapsing during diastole. And here's an example of RV dilation. So here's the LV again in short axis. The RV, which should be just a nice little croissant wrapped around the LV, is now turned into a massive croissant and it's compressing the septum there, causing septal flattening. So this could be acute, could be chronic, but in the context of shock and a suspected PE, this could well represent a massive PE. The next step of the HIMAP exam is I for IVC. So we put the probe just below the Ziffy sternum and slide just across to the patient's right hand side. So here's the IVC of our 15 year old patient in long axis. It's more than two centimeters in diameter and it's not collapsing much with respiration. So this is a plethoric IVC. And here's an example of the other end of the spectrum. You can just see a slit like IVC running behind the liver here. So it's narrow, it's collapsing. So this is suggestive of hypovolemia. The next part of the HIMAP exam is M for Morrison's pouch, but this is really a free fluid scan. So the right and left upper quadrants and the pelvis. So this would be relevant if there was intra-abdominal bleeding. Also, if there was a young lady who you suspected may have a ruptured ectopic, you can look for free fluid in that context as well. But in this case, 
you know, as a young man, uh, there was no history of trauma, no abdominal pain, so I actually decided to skip this part of the HIMAP exam. However, if you were to do this exam, I'll show you some examples of some of the pathology that you are looking for. So this is the right upper quadrant, here's the liver, here's the kidney, and what do you think is this big black or anechoic structure here? Is that free fluid, do you think? This is actually a renal cyst, and we know it's a cyst because of its shape, it's round. So free fluid tends to fill in all the little nooks and crannies between other round structures, so it tends to look spiky, whereas fluid within a lumen tends to look more round. Here's an example of free fluid, this little sliver of black or anechoic fluid between the liver and the kidney. So in the context of trauma, that could be blood. In the context of liver failure, that could be ascites. In the context of a young pregnant female, that could be from a ruptured ectopic. And here's some more free fluid. And notice how these black or anechoic areas cause these kind of spiky interdigitations between the round loops of bowel. The fourth part of the HIMAP exam is A for aorta. So we scan the whole abdominal aorta from CT sternum down to bifurcation. Again, in my case, I didn't actually think this was relevant. It's a 15 year old, no abdominal pain. So again, I skipped this part of the exam, but here's an example of an aorta. Okay, so here's uh, an example of an aorta in long axis from head down to feet. Here's the celiac trunk, here's the SMA. This is a normal aorta, two centimeters in diameter. So if you can see the whole abdominal aorta and you can see its normal diameter throughout, then you've ruled out a AAA. However, if you see a AAA, ultrasound cannot tell you whether it's ruptured or not. For that, you need a CT. So here's an example of a big AAA with some clot within the wall there. So if you saw this in a patient with shock, this would make you very worried that this had ruptured. If the patient was stable enough, you could try and get a CT to actually confirm if it was leaking. And the other thing to keep your eye out for is a dissection flap shown here in the aorta in long axis. Okay, the final part of the HIMAP exam is P for pneumothorax. So we switch to the high frequency probe and we move up to the anterior chest. So we're looking here for lung sliding. So this is the right anterior chest. This is the pleural line here. And as the patient's breathing in and out, there is normal lung sliding. So this rules out a pneumothorax at that point. And the same on the left, normal lung sliding. Now, if there was a tension pneumothorax causing shock, the whole lung on that side would be collapsed, and so you wouldn't see any lung sliding. So even just a quick scan of the anterior chest rules out a tension pneumothorax as a cause of your patient's shock. But can you also notice there are some bright white vertical lines coming down from the pleural line? These are called B lines. And Isolated bee lines are not really specific to anything, but if you can build up a pattern and distribution of them and put them together with other findings, then they can be very useful. So here they are bilateral, and so I scanned down to the patient's lung bases as well, and I saw these black or anechoic pleural effusions. So when you see symmetrical dependent bee lines with associated pleural effusions, and then you combine that with the poor LV function that we saw and a plethoric IVC, this builds up a very strong case for pulmonary edema. So to summarize the findings, the heart showed severely and globally impaired systolic function. The IVC was plethoric. We skipped over the Morrison's pouch and the aorta. There was no pneumothorax, but there was pulmonary edema. So within about two minutes of entering the room, we'd gone from a point of having no idea what was the cause of this young man's shock to a confirmed diagnosis of cardiogenic shock and pulmonary edema. So we stopped giving the IV fluids, we didn't worry about the IV antibiotics, we got cardiology involved, we got the patient on an inotrope infusion, and he did very well. And I think this case really demonstrates the potential power of point of care ultrasound. You know, it's not necessarily that useful in all your patients, but in your sick resus patients with shock or respiratory failure, POCUS is a very, very powerful tool and it can rapidly transform the complete direction of management for your patient. But next, a brief review of the evidence for using POCUS in shock. And why not start with this paper by Shock Ui in 2015. It's a small paper, just showed a modest reduction in diagnostic uncertainty. Then in 2018, there was a slightly larger paper from North America 
that tried to show a mortality benefit to using POCUS in shock. And it was a negative study, so there was no statistically significant mortality difference found. However, because shock was already quite well established by this time, you know, the ethics committee insisted on many exclusions, basically the patients where POCUS is known to be most useful. And so in the end, more than half of the patients had occult sepsis, which is probably where POCUS is least useful. So I think it's still a bit unclear whether there could be a mortality difference in select patients. 2019, there was a meta-analysis and systematic review. Only four papers and 350 patients, uh, but they looked at the diagnostic accuracy for POCUS in different types of shock. And I'll walk you through this table. So on the left, we have likelihood ratios. As you know, a positive likelihood ratio of more than 10 is a good test for ruling in a disease, and a negative likelihood ratio of less than 0 0.1 is a good test for ruling out a disease. So for hypovolemic shock, POCUS is okay, not great. A bit better for distributive shock, this is primarily septic shock. Better for chirogenic shock, and the best for obstructive shock, with a positive likelihood ratio of 40 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.1. Then just earlier this year, Berg and colleagues performed another systematic review, this time six papers, 850 patients, and they looked at diagnostic accuracy ranges. So without POCUS, the range was about 50%. With POCUS, it went up to 80 to 89%. So even though there's some uncertainty here, and it's not a huge number of patients, I think you'd agree this is pretty impressive data that POCUS can significantly improve diagnostic accuracy in patients with undifferentiated shock. So to summarize the evidence, there's no evidence of mortality benefit, but there's pretty good evidence for diagnostic accuracy, and it seems to be best for obstructive and cardiogenic shock. Another way to think about POCUS and shock is the pump, tank, and pipes analogy. And I'll walk you through this table. So on the left, we have pump, tank, and pipes, and then across the top, we have the different types of shock. So let's start with hypovolemic shock. So here the pump, or the heart, will be hyperdynamic and empty, and the tank, or IVC, will be empty as well, or flat. And there may also be signs of the source of hypovolemia, so potentially free fluid in the abdomen or a big AAA, for example. In cardiogenic shock, the pump, or the heart, is failing, so it's hypodynamic, and if it's more chronic, it may be dilated. The IVC, or the tank, will be plethoric, overflowing, and there may also be signs of pulmonary edema, so B-lines, particularly in the dependent areas with associated pleural effusions. Obstructive shock is really an umbrella term for three different conditions, so tamponade, massive PE, and tension pneumothorax. So in tamponade, obviously you'll see pericardial fluid. In a massive PE, you'll see RV dilation. And in tension pneumothorax, you'll see absent lung sliding. But in all three of these types of obstructive shock, you see a plethoric IVC. So IVC is actually a great place to start with a shock scan because if you see a narrow collapsing IVC, you can immediately rule out all three causes of obstructive shock. If you do see RV dilation and you're not sure whether it could be acute or chronic, perhaps your patient has a history of chronic lung disease and you think this may just be an incidental chronic finding, then it can be really useful to look for a DVT. Because if you can identify a DVT, this is highly specific for ruling in an acute PE. Distributive shock, this is mostly septic shock, and here ultrasound is not great at diagnosing that you have septic shock. However, if you can find a source of sepsis with ultrasound, then this rules in septic shock, and not only rules it in, but gives you the source as well. There are lots of different protocols for using ultrasound in shock, so please don't create another one if you were thinking about it. I think we have enough. Uh, the most commonly used one in the UK is the RUSH exam that we've talked about, also known as HIMAP. So HIMAP is a perfectly adequate sort of starting point. It gives you a nice structure so you don't forget things. But I'd hate for you to feel sort of trapped in a rigid box. Uh, as we saw in our case, we actually left out Morrison's and Aorta because they weren't relevant. Uh, and by the same token, you can also add in elements that you think are more relevant. Uh, so feel free to step outside the box. And I like to think of this as the HIMAP Plus. So as I mentioned, the other things that can be useful to add to your HIMAP exam are a DVT, 
and also sources of sepsis. So here's an example of a DVT. We've got the popliteal artery on the deep side of the screen, and then superficially, we've got the popliteal vein. And we can see echogenic matter within the vein. And also you can see as the operator is compressing with the probe, the walls are not coming together. So that is a DVT. Again, in the context of shock, this would make you very worried about an acute massive PE. So the other element that can be useful to add to your HIMAP exam is sources of sepsis. So here's an example of pneumonia. This is the diaphragm here, this bright white line. And above the diaphragm, we don't normally see lung tissue like this, but when it becomes consolidated, it takes on this sort of speckled echo texture. It kind of looks a bit like the liver. And so this is also known as hepatization of the lung. So here's an example of cholecystitis. So this is the gallbladder. We've got a big fat stone with a shadow here lodged in the neck sort of sludge above it, very thickened wall. So again, in the context of undifferentiated shock, this should make you very worried that the patient has septic shock, secondary to cholecystitis. And finally, hydronephrosis. So this is the kidney. We don't normally see the collecting system, but here it's become enlarged. You can see the calyces here. This is also known as the bear's paw appearance. So in the, again, in the context of a patient with shock, this would make you worried they have urosepsis. Okay, so the first part of this session was focusing on using POCUS to diagnose the cause of your patient's shock. Uh, next, we'll just say a few words about using POCUS to guide whether to give IV fluids. So let's say you've done your HIMAP exam and you haven't found any obvious reversible cause. There's no tamponade to drain, there's no tension pneumothorax to drain, there's no massive PE to thrombolize. You're not sure, maybe the patient has septic shock, maybe hypovolemic, you're not really sure. How can we use POCUS to try and guide that decision of whether to give a fluid bolus? I'll talk about a basic approach and then a more advanced approach. So the basic approach is just to look at the heart, the IVC and the lungs. Uh, and we've already looked at these organs already using our HIMAP system. So if you see a heart that is failing, an IVC, that is plethoric and lungs that are wet, then this should be screaming at you, please stop giving IV fluids. A patient with these findings and hypotension has cardiogenic shock uh, and it's very difficult to manage, has a very high mortality, but IV fluids will certainly make it worse. On the other hand, if you see a hyperdynamic heart, a narrow collapsing IVC and dry lungs, then sure, this patient very well may have hypovolemic shock. IV fluids may well be of benefit to your patient. But let's say it's not clear to you from your basic scans whether your patient may or may not benefit from IV fluids. Uh, and so you want to use some other more advanced technique to assess fluid responsiveness. So there's been a lot of research on this topic and there are various different measures that can be used pulse pressure variation, central venous pressure, pulmonary artery catheters, thermodilution, uh, LV end diastolic area change, LV VTI, carotid VTI, PEEP challenge, bioreactants, end tidal CO2, there's a lot. Uh, so most of them use fancy equipment uh, and a lot of them also require your patient to be intubated and ventilated. So as an emergency physician dealing with mostly spontaneously breathing patients and without access to fancy equipment, the, the one marker that I would choose as the most useful is LVVTI. But before we move on to VTI, first just a word about ejection fraction versus stroke volume. So in healthy patients, these two things correlate well with each other, but in sick patients, they can actually be quite different. So consider this parasternal short axis with a very thickened LV. Ejection fraction here is almost 100%, but stroke volume is actually quite low. And compare that with this parasternal long axis from our case, where ejection fraction is very low, but actually stroke volume may be similar to the case on the left. So LV chamber size can make a big difference on ejection fraction, but can also be affected by other factors as well. For example, if your patient has severe mitral regurgitation, there could be a relatively high ejection fraction, but relatively low stroke volume. So my point is, in a clinical context, which one of these things is actually more relevant to us? 
I would argue stroke volume is more relevant, especially if we are going to do an intervention and then test it before and after to look for a response. We want to know how much blood is the heart actually pumping out. And VTI, as we'll see, is a good surrogate for stroke volume. So left ventricular VTI, or velocity time integral, so let me walk you through how to take this measurement. So first you get a good apical five chamber view and you drop your pulse wave Doppler line like this through the aortic valve and you put your pulse wave gate just before the aortic valve. And this is what it looks like on ultrasound. So five chamber view, pulse wave Doppler gate just before aortic valve. Then you activate pulse wave Doppler and you get this waveform or trace shown here. So this is the baseline. So this V shaped segment of the waveform represents blood moving from the LV down into the aorta. So it's going away from the probe, so down from the baseline. And that V-shaped waveform relates to a column of blood moving out of the LV OT into the aorta. So this is a surrogate of stroke volume. Technically, a VTI is the distance that one blood cell travels during one heartbeat. So normal is about 20 centimeters. And if you want, you can multiply it by the LVOT area to actually get a stroke volume. But the LVOT area is fixed, it's constant. So actually, if you're looking for changes in stroke volume, you can just leave that out and just use VTI by itself. Especially if you want to do a measurement before or after fluids and look for a change, just use VTI. It's much simpler uh, and you don't actually need to use the stroke volume. You can just use LV VTI by itself. So an increase of 15% is generally considered the threshold for responsiveness. So if you do a, a VTI measurement and it's 15, and then you give 500 mils of fluid, and you do another one, and it's gone up to 25, then you can say, okay, this patient's cardiac output has increased significantly after that fluid bolus. A word of caution though, uh, using these Doppler measurements is quite technically difficult, and there's a lot of potential for error. For example, if your, if your Doppler wave is not straight through the aortic valve, if it's at an angle, you can introduce error. So please just don't go out and start using it purely based on this very brief explanation. Uh, you do need proper supervision and mentorship. Okay, now let's think a little bit about fluid responsiveness. So let's say we give a fluid bolus and we look for a change in cardiac output. If there's less than 15% increase in VTI, we haven't done what we were intending to do and so the fluids may have caused harm. If there was, that's still not the end of the story. We still need to think about, does that relate to improved oxygen delivery? If no, it may cause harm. If yes, does that actually relate to improved oxygen utilization at the mitochondrial level? If no, the fluids still may cause harm. If yes, we still need to think, is any of this benefit sustained for more than just one or two hours? If no, still might cause harm. If yes, okay, fair enough. In that case, the fluids probably benefited the patient. But the point is, even assessing for fluid responsiveness and cardiac output is really only the first step. There's a lot more to it. If you think of shock as a state of impaired tissue oxygenation, then actually improving cardiac output is really just the first step. Finally, I'd just like to mention VEXUS, or venous excess ultrasound. This is a relatively new technique uh, that uses Doppler to quantify the degree of fluid overload or organ congestion that your patient has. So the first step is to look at the IVC, and if it's more than two centimeters, then you move on to look at these Doppler measurements. If it's less than two centimeters, then you can stop there. Now this table shows how you use Doppler on the hepatic, portal, and renal veins. So you get waveforms when the patient is normal, when they're mildly congested, and when they're severely congested. I'm not going to go through all the details now because it's quite technical uh, and I don't actually use this routinely in my patients but I think VEXUS has actually had a really useful impact on the way we clinicians think about fluid therapy because it really shines a light on patients who do have venous congestion because uh, it's, it's quite difficult to, to see this clinically but if you can scan an organ and you can see it's congested then this really makes you think twice about whether to give fluids. And I think this challenges the, the sort of dogma in the medical world that fluids are a benign, safe therapy that should be basically given to anyone who has 
shock or sepsis when there's really not that much evidence showing it's of benefit in these patients. And so I think Vexus could have an important role in changing the mindset of a lot of clinicians regarding the way they think about IV fluids. If you're thinking about upskilling in some of these more advanced techniques such as VTI or Vexus, I'd strongly recommend that you check out this document. FUSIC is the Intensive Care Society ultrasound program and HD is hemodynamics. So this is beyond just your normal FUSIC heart. This is like advanced techniques uh, and it's a brilliant document. It has about 10 different specific topics that they think are the most relevant to critically ill patients with shock. So VTI and Vexus are in there, but there are also eight other really interesting uh, topics as well. Because if you are going to try and learn one of these more advanced techniques, it's important you have some kind of structure, you know, with a mentor and a logbook, etc. And so this provides that structure for you. Okay, some take-home points. So first, we talked about shock protocols, and specifically the HIMAP exam. We talked about how there's actually good evidence for its diagnostic accuracy, particularly in obstructive and cardiogenic shock. We talked about how there were lots of different protocols. HIMAP is probably the most commonly used one in the UK, so I think that's a good one to start with. Uh, when you scan the heart, you look for three things, tamponade, RV dilation, and also LV function. And when you're assessing LV function, use the eyeball method. How much are the walls coming in? How much are they thickening? And also you can augment this with the EPSS, E-point septal separation. So the gap between the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the septum. And if the cowboy bursting into the saloon analogy helps you understand this, then great. You can also adapt your HIMAP exam and make it more of a HIMAP plus system. So adding in things like DVT to assess for an acute PE and sources of sepsis. Then we talked a bit about how to use ultrasound to help with your decisions around IV fluids. So the basic approach is just to look at the heart, IVC and the lung. And if you're getting very strong signals one way or the other, that is often all you need. But if you would like to use more advanced tools, I would recommend LVVTI uh, and potentially Vexus as two useful tools to look for fluid responsiveness and also the other end of the coin, fluid congestion. And if you're considering uh, embarking down this road, then check out that FUSIC HD document. Here are my references. Thanks for your attention, and if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email at the address below.